country diggers here. Today we're going to be talking about the legend of the crystal skulls. Okay, I had a chance to go into a liquor store last week and uh, I purchased this. I don't usually frequent liquor stores because I don't drink alcohol. But uh, this is the crystal head skull uh, vodka. It, um, Dan Aykroyd and John Alexander uh, designed the bottles and made the vodka and everything. But we're not going to be talking about the vodka or the uh, company or anything like that. We're going to be talking about the crystal skulls. Now, uh, I'm not, this is full of vodka. I'm not going to open it and drink it because I don't like alcohol. I do like the bottles, though. All right. This article is on uh, Arche Archaeology Archive. It's from uh, Archaeology Magazine, from the archive archaeology.org. Okay? And it's by Jane McLaren Walsh. So I'll be reading an article by her. Okay, this okay. article was written in June of 2008. So, it's the legend of the Crystal Skulls. Along with superstars like Harrison Ford, Kate Blanchett, and Shia LaBeouf, the newest Indiana Jones movie promises to showcase one of the most anemic classes of artifacts known to archaeologists. Remember, this is in 2008 when the Indiana Jones and the Legend of the Crystal Skull was released. Okay. Um, crystal skulls that first surfaced in the 19th century and that specialist attributed to various ancient Mesoamerican cultures. In this article, Smithsonian anthropologist Jane McLaren uh, Walsh Jane McLaren Wall shares her own adventures analyzing the artifacts that inspired Indiana Jones and in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and details her efforts tracking down a mysterious obtainer of rare antiquities who may have held the key to the origin of these exotic objects. Sixteen years ago, a heavy package addressed to the non-existent Smithsonian Institute curator, uh, Mesoamerican Museum, Washington, D.C., was delivered to the National Museum of American History. It, accompanied by, it was accompanied by an unsigned letter stating the, this Aztec skull, crystal skull, purported to be part of the Porfolio Diaz collection was purchased in Mexico in 1960. Forgive me if I don't say these words correctly. I am offering it to the Smithsonian without consideration. Richard Alburn, then curator of the Hispanic American collections, uh, knew of my expertise in Mexican <clears throat> archaeology and called me to ask whether I knew anything about the object. An eerie milky white crystal skull considerably larger than a human head. I told him I knew of a life-size crystal skull on display at the British Museum and had seen a smaller version uh, in the Smithsonian had once exhibited as a fake. After we spent a few minutes puzzling over the meaning and significance of this unusual artifact, he asked whether the Department of Anthropology would be interested in accepting it for the national collections. I said yes without hesitation. If the skull turned out to be uh, a genuine pre-Columbian Mesoamerican artifact, such a rare object should definitely become part of the national collections. I couldn't have imagined then 
that this unsolicited donation would open an entirely new avenue of research for me. In the years since the package arrived, my investigation of this single skull has led me to research the history of pre-Columbian collections in museums around the world. And I have collaborated with a broad range of international scientists and museum curators who have also crossed paths with the crystal skulls. Studying these artifacts has prompted new research into Colombian uh, or stoneworking, Colombian stoneworking uh, technology, particularly the carving of hard stones like jadeite and quartz. Crystal skulls have undergone serious scholarly uh, scrutiny, but they also excite the popular imagination because they seem so mysterious. Theories about their origins abound. Some believe the skulls are the handiwork of the Mayan or Aztecs, but they also they have also become the subject of constant discussion on occult websites. Some insist that they originated on a sunken continent or in a faraway galaxy, and now they are posed to become archaeological superstars, thanks to our celluloid colleague, Indiana Jones, who will tackle the subject of our research in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Details about the movie's plot are being closely guarded by the film's producers, as I write this, but the Internet rumor mill has it that the crystal skull of the title is the creator of aliens. Okay. Uh, I just watched the aliens movies uh, a while back. Um, well, last week I watched them. Okay. I, I like the aliens movies. I don't believe in aliens. I think uh, that uh, these sightings of unidentified flying objects and Aliens, I think they're made up. I think, I think they're lies. I think the government is wanting us to believe that aliens exist for some unknown reason. I can guess what, but I won't go into it right now. But anyway, I think it's all a big lie. <clears throat> anyway, these exotic carvings are usually attributed to pre-Columbian Mesoamerican cultures, but not a single crystal skull in a museum collection comes from a documented excavation, and they have little stylistic or techno te technical relationship with any genuine pre-Columbian depictions of skulls, which are an important motif in Mesoamerican iconology. They are intensively loved today by a large uh, section of aging hippies and new age devotees. But what is the truth behind the crystal skulls? Where did they come from? And why were they made? Museums began collecting rock crystal skulls during the second half of the 19th century when no specific archaeological excavations had been undertaken in Mexico and knowledge of real pre-Columbian artifacts was scarce. It was also a period that saw a burgeoning industry in fake pre-Columbian objects. When Smithsonian archaeologist W.H. Holmes visited Mexico City in 1884, he saw relic shops in parentheses it has it in parentheses relic shops on every corner filled with fake ceramic vessels whistles and figurines two years later holmes warned about the abundance of fake pre-columbian artifacts in museum collections in an article for the journal science titled the trade in spurious spurious 
Mexican antiquities. <clears throat> the first Mexican crystal skull made their debut just before the 1863 French intervi intervention when Louis Napoleon's army invaded the country and installed Maximilian von Hasburg of Austria as emperor. Usually they are small, not taller than 1.5 inches. The earliest specimen seems to be a British Museum crystal skull, about half an inch that may have been acquired in 1856 by British banker Henry Christie. Two other examples were exhibited in 1867 at the Exposition Universal in Paris as part of the collection of Eugene Bohan. Perhaps the most mysterious figure in the history of Crystal Skull, of the Crystal Skulls, a Frenchman who served as an official archeologist of the Mexican, Mexican court of Maximilian, Bohan was also a member of the French Scientific Commission in Mexico, whose work, in, whose work the Paris Exposition was designed to highlight. The Exposition was not entirely successful in showcasing Louis Napoleon's Second Empire, since its opening coincided with the execution of Maximilian by the forces of Mexican President Benito Juarez. One small crystal skull was purchased in 1874 for 28 pesos by Mex Mexico City's National Museum. From the, Mexico, from the Mexican collector, Luis Constantino, and another for 30 pesos in 1880. In 1886, the Smithsonian bought a small crystal skull, this one from the collection of Augustin Fisher, who had been Emperor Maximilian's secretary in Mexico but it disappeared mysteriously from the collection sometime after 1973. It has been on display in an exhibit of archaeological fakes after William Fosshag, a Smithsonian mineralogist, realized in the 1950s that it had been carved with a modern uh, lapidary wheel. These small objects represent the first generation of crystal skulls, and they are all drilled through from top to bottom. The drill holes may in fact be pre-Columbian in origin, and the skulls may have been uh, simple Mesoamerican quartz crystals, beads, later recarved for the European market as, a li as little mementos or objects meant to remind their owners of the eventu eventuality of death. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink. And no, I'm not drinking that vodka, I'm drinking water. <clears throat> In my research into the province of Crystal Skulls, I kept encountering Bohan's name. He arrived in Mexico in his teens and spent an idyllic youth conducting his own archaeological expeditions and collecting exotic birds. <clears throat> Boban fell in love with Mexican culture, becoming fluent in Spanish and the Aztec language, and began to make his living selling archaeological artifacts and natural history specimens through a family business in Mexico City. After returning to France, he opened an antiquity shop in Paris in the 1870s and sold a large part of his original Mexican archaeological collection to Alphonse Pinart, a French explorer and ethnographer. Graphic, in 1878, Penart donated the collection, 
which included three crystal skulls to the Tor Torcado, the pers pursuer of the most D Hom, ah, whatever. Bohan had acquired the third skull in the pen art collection sometime after his return to Paris. That um, Torcado uh, is spelled T R O C A D E R O. And the museum, I guess, I guess it was a museum, it's called M U S E E D E L H O M M E. Okay. All right. It is several times larger. Um, the the skull pen art uh, the in pen art's collection after his return to Paris is it is several times larger than any of the others from this early period, measuring about four inches high. This skull now is in the what I just spelled. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, it wasn't. Okay, it's a different one. It's called M-U-S-E-E-D-U-Q-U-A-I-B-R-A-N-L-Y. -E 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 Brandley, something. Has a large hole drilled vertically through its center. There is a comparable, though smaller, skull about 2.5 inches high in their private collection. It serves as a base for a crucifix, the somewhat larger Quarry Brandley skull um, may have led a similar use, had a similar use. <clears throat> a second generation skull, ah, wait a minute. A second generation skull Life size without a vertical hole first appeared in 1881 in the Paris shop of none other than Boban. This skull is just under six inches high. The description in the catalog he published provided no fine spot for the object, and it is listed separately from his Mexican antiquities. Boban called it a masterpiece of lapidary technology and noted that it was unique in the world. Despite being one of a kind, the skull failed to sell. So when Boban returned to Mexico City in 1885, after a 16-year absence, he took it with him. He exhibited it alongside a collection of actual human skulls in his shop, which he dubbed the Muso... Oh. M U S E O C I E N T I F I C O. According to local gossip, Boban tied, tried to sell it to Mexico's National Museum as an Aztec artifact. In partnership with um, Leopold Baratz, Batres, uh, B A T R E S, whose official government title was Protector of Pre Hispanic Monuments. But the museum's curator assumed the skull was a glass fake and refused to purchase it. Then Beatrice denounced Boban as a fraud and accused him of smug smuggling antiquities. In July 1886, the French Antiquarian, the French antiquarian moved his museum business and collection to New York City <clears throat> and later held an auction of several thousand archaeological artifacts, colonial Mexican manuscripts, and a large library of books. Tiffany and Company bought the crystal skull at this auction for $950. A decade later, Tiffany sold it to the British Museum for the original purchase price. 
Interestingly, Boban's 1886 catalog for the New York auction lists yet another crystal skull of the smaller variety. It is described as being from the Valley of Mexico. <clears throat> It is described as being from the Valley of Mexico and is listed with a crystal hand, which is described as Aztec. Neither of these objects can now be accounted for. <clears throat> a third generation of skulls appeared sometime before 1934, when Sidney Burney, a London art dealer, purchased a crystal skull of proportions almost identical to the specimen the British Museum bought from Tiffany's. There is no information about where he got it, but it is very, it is very nearly a replica of the British Museum skull, almost exactly the same shape, but with more detailed modeling of the eyes and the teeth. It also has a separate manable which puts it in a class by itself. In 1943, it was sold at Slosby's, Slosby's, is that how you say that? S-O-T-H-E-B-Y-S, apostrophe S, in London to Frederick author Mike Mitchell Hedges. A well-to-do English deep-sea fisherman explorer and yarn spinner extraordinaire. <laughs> Since the 1954 publication of Mitchell Hedges' <clears throat> memoir, Danger in My Alley, this third-generation 20th century skull has acquired a mine origin, as well as a number of fantastic Indiana Jones-like tales, tall tales, his adopted daughter, Anna Mitchell Hedges, who died last year, well, I guess in 2004 since, I mean, 2007 since this article was 2008, at the age of 100, wow, cared for it for 60 years, occasionally exhibiting the skull privately for a fee. It is currently in the possession of her widower, but ten nieces and nephews have also laid claim to it. Known as the Skull of Doom, the Skull of Love, or simply the Mitchell Hedges Skull, it is said to emit, emit blue lights from its eyes and has reputedly crashed computer hard drives. Hmm. Although nearly all of these skulls have at times been identified as Aztec, Toltec, Mixtec, or occasionally Mayan, they do not reflect the artistic or stylistic characteristics of any of these cultures. The Aztec and Toltec versions of death heads were nearly always carved in basalt, in basalt occasionally were covered with stucco and were probably all painted. They were usually either attached to walls or altars or depicted in base reliefs of deity, deities as ornaments worn on belts. They are, they are compar comparatively crudely carved but are more naturalistic than the crystal skulls, particularly in the depiction of the teeth. The Mixtec occasionally fabricated skulls in gold, but these representations are mostly, are more precisely described as skull-like faces with intact, intact eyes, noses, and ears. The Mayan also carved skulls, but in relief of, on limestone. Often these skulls depicted in profile represent days of their calendars. French and other European buyers imagined they were buying skillful pre-Columbian carvings, partially convinced, perhaps by their own fascinated horror, with Aztec human sacrifice. 
but the Aztecs didn't hang crystal skulls around their necks. Instead, they displayed the skulls of sacrificial victims on racks, impaling them horizontally, uh, although the sides, uh, horizontally through the sides, the patinal temporal region, not vertically. I believe that all the smaller crystal skulls that constitute the first generation of fakes were made in Mexico around the time they were sold, between 1858 and 1880. This 24-year period may represent the output of a single artisan or perhaps a single woodshop, workshop. <clears throat> the larger 1878 Paris skull seems to be some sort of transi transitional piece as it follows the vertical dr drilling of the smaller pieces but its size precludes it being a bead or being worn in any way. This skull now resides in the basement laboratories of the Lever, Lever, uh, L, L O V L O U V R E. I, I know that word, I just can't uh, pronounce it. Um. <laughs> And the M U S E E D U Q U A I Branley B R A N L Y has begun a program of scientific testing on the piece that will include <clears throat> advanced elemental analysis techniques like particle induced X ray admission and Raymond spectro. <laughs> so we may know more about its material and age in the near future. In 1878, Par the Paris Skull and Boban Tiffany British Museum Skull that appeared in 1881 are perhaps 19th century European inventions. There is no direct tie to Mexico for either of these two larger skulls, except through Boban. They simply appear in Paris long after his initial return from Mexico in 1863. The Mitchell Hedges skull, which appears after 1934, is a veritable copy of the British Museum skull with stylistic and technical flourishes that only an accomplished faker would devise. In fact, in 1936, British Museum scholar Adrian Digby first raised the possibility that the Mitchell Hedges skull could be a copy of the British Museum skull since it showed a perverted ingenuity such as one would expect to find in a forager. <laughs> However, Digby, then a young curator, did not suggest it was a modern forgery and also dismiss the possibility that his museum's own crystal skull was a fraud. As early 20th century microscopic examination did not reveal the presence of modern tool marks. The skull that arrived at the Smithsonian 16 years ago represents yet another generation of these hoaxes. According to According to its anonymous donor, it was purchased in Mexico in 1960, and the size perhaps reflects the exuberance of the time. In comparison with the original 19th century skulls, the Smithsonian skull is enormous. At 31 pounds and nearly 10 inches high, it dwarfs all others. I believe it was probably manufactured in Mexico shortly before it was sold. The skull is now part of the Smithsonian National Collections and even has its own catalog number, 409954. At the moment, it is stored in a locked cabinet in my, in my office. There are, now, <clears throat> there are now fifth and probably sixth generation skulls, and I have been asked to examine quite a number of them. 
Collectors have brought me skulls purportedly from Mexico, Guatemala, Brazil, and even Tibet. Some of these crystal skulls have turned out to be glass. A few are made of resin. British Museum scientist Margaret Sachs and I examined the British Museum and Smithsonian skulls under light and scanning electron microscope and conclusively determined that they were carved with relatively modern lapidary equipment, which were unavailable to pre-Columbian Mesoamerican carvers. A preliminary report on our research is on the British Museum website, www.britishmuseum.ac.uk slash compass, C-O-M-P-A-S-S, if y'all want to look it up, maybe. So why have crystal skulls had such a long and successful run? And why do some museums continue, continue to exhibit them? despite their lack of agriculture context and oblivious icon, iconographic, stylistic, and technical problems. Though the British Museum exhibits its skulls as examples of fakes, others still offer them up as the genuine article. Mexico's National Museum, for example, identifies its skulls as the work of Aztec and Mixtec artisans. Perhaps it is because, like the Indiana Jones movies, these macabre objects are reliable crowd-pleasers. Impressed by their techni technical excellence and gleaming polish, generations of museum curators and private collectors have been taken in by these objects, but they are too good to be true. If we consider that pre-Columbian lapidaries used stone, bone, wooden, and possibly car uh, copper tools with abrasive sand to carve stone, crystal skulls are much too per perfectly carved and highly polished to be believed. Ultimately, the truth behind the skulls may have gone to the grave with Boban, a masterful, masterful dealer of many thousands of pre-Columbian artifacts, including at least five different crystal skulls, now safely in constant museums worldwide. He managed to confound a great many people for a very long time and has left an intriguing legacy, one that continues to puzzle us as a century after his death. Boban confidently sold museums and private collectors some of the most intriguing fakes known, and perhaps many more yet to be recognized. It sounds like a great premise for a movie. And this was by Jane McLaren Walsh. She's an art uh, anthropologist at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Hope y'all enjoyed. Have a great week. See you soon. Bye.